everyone. Welcome back to Real Life. I hope you're having a wonderful day. If you enjoy these vintage episodes, please hit the like button. That helps promote them to like-minded viewers like yourself. Consider subscribing and you'll be notified of new episodes. Members get early previews one to two weeks in advance. There's something new and different every weekend. If you're interested specifically in vintage films and videos in Western Canada, there are hundreds of episodes waiting for you to discover some as far back as the 1920s. You can find them on the interactive map guide located in the details below. Today's episode is quite special. It's a conversation between two members of the Second World War Pathfinder Force of No. 7 Squadron Royal Air Force. Flight Lieutenant Edwin Bud Causey, DFC, and Flight Engineer Frank Pointer that is being aired publicly for the first time. This recording was made in May 1995. The Pathfinders were target marking squadrons in RAF's Bomber Command during the Second World War. They located and marked targets with flares at which a main bomber force could aim, increasing their accuracy of their bombing. Edwin was the eldest of seven children born September 13, 1916 to Frank and Eva Causey of Regina. His brother Bob made his mark in real estate business while Lou became a doctor and a well-known physician in the Regina area. Sisters Jean, Kath, Helen, and Betty completed the family roster. Bud worked in the family businesses and other jobs for several years. Seeing the possibility of war looming on the horizon, Bud joined the ranks of the Regina Rifles in 1938, but before long felt that he had more to offer to the war effort wearing blue instead of khaki. In September, he remustered at the Royal Canadian Air Force and was whisked off to High River, just south of Calgary, to begin pilot training as part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. They began by flying the reliable Tiger Moth, then progressed to the Cessna Cranes, eventually the Ansons for multi-engine qualification. Upon arrival in England, he was immediately assigned to train on bombers, first the Halifax and ultimately the mighty Lancaster. As it happened in those days, many Canadian lads were assigned to the Royal Air Force. A tour consisted of 30 missions. Halfway through his first tour, due to his superior flying skills, Flight Sergeant Causey accepted the challenge and was drafted to the fledging No. 7 Squadron Pathfinder Force. Before long, he was promoted to flying officer and was entitled to wear the Elite Pathfinder's Badge, a brass eagle with wings extended, truly a mark of distinction. Based out of an aerodrome in the south of England in Oakington, he completed his first tour and was fully entitled to hang up his wings and return home to Canada. Instead, he opted to sign up for a second tour which ultimately resulted in his being awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Pathfinders would leave their base just prior to the main force, then carefully locate the targets and mark them with colored smoke flares, so the main force had something to aim at. The squadron's diary is filled with names of cities, Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, Berlin, railway yards, refineries, and mining missions off the Danish coast, but there were many losses among the Lancasters. On one occasion, Bud found it necessary to land at a U.S. Air Force base some distance from Middenhall Aerodrome. He was fed a meal and faced a lengthy train trip back to his own squadron. Made aware of the situation, the U.S. squadron commander arranged for him to be ferried back on a test flight when the weather cleared. Actor Jimmy Stewart was that squadron commander. Following the war in 1945, Bud was offered a position with BOAC, a British airline, but opted instead to return to Canada. In May 1995, 50 years after the end of the war and last seeing his Lancaster crew before repatriation, Bud was reunited with his flight engineer, Frank Pointer, where they traveled to Nanton, Alberta to see one of the last remaining Lancasters in existence and to speak of their experiences for the first time in a half century. This is their conversation. There she is, Frank. That's I've her. never thought I'd see one of these things again. Beautiful. Was. You look at the size, bud, and you, you just don't realize how big the damn thing was, do you? Yeah. Uh, this yes. one here has seen a few ops. Look at the ripples in it. Yeah. Do you remember the time that that starboard outer failed on takeoff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah funny old days. Yes. Yeah, you were, a bloody good, you were a bloody good driver, but I was, just I was sure. lucky, I was lucky that time. The zero feet just bouncing on the ground. And 
They have tread on these tires, Frank. Look at here. <laughs> Only <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> Ours used to be smooth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the time we blew that one on landing? I do. Mm -hmm. And apparently we had some flak damage on this target, and we didn't know until we sat down. That's right. We sure did a wide swing when we, <laughs> after touching down. And the old crash wagon came out. That, uh, you jumped out with a fire extinguisher. She was standing there holding it until the, the crash crew got there, but she didn't blow. Nope. nope. And I was telling the navigator, get out. I got to put my papers together. <laughs> I said, Never mind your bloody papers. Get out. <laughs> oh, we've had some funny old times. Yeah. Like the, just the, where did that where did that uh, incendiary go through? Well, it was somewhere here, but mainly on the port side. Yes, but, but just uh, between where? That's right. But on on uh, port yeah. side, it was in between the number one and two tanks. Yeah. And just do you remember the flight sergeant said you were bloody lucky? Uh -huh. And he but said, that, why, "Why?" He said, "Well, in between the number one and number two tanks, and you've only got a distance of that. Mm -hmm. There was three incendiaries mm -hmm. dropped from some guy above us that hadn't gone off." Well, two of them came through the fuselage, well, too. Two, two, two. two. I, I had one for a paperweight yeah, for yeah, a while, and yeah, I lost yeah. it someplace. Yes, I think that one of them went out quicker than it came in. Yeah, I just had a piece that stayed in, a safe piece. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These aren't near as long as they were in the old Sterling. That's a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, where did the cookie go, Frank? Right, right here, there, right, right there. there. Yeah, yeah. And these were thousand pounds. That's right. And then we had the containers with the incendiaries. Incendiaries, sure. What, what was the all at weight uh, bomb load? 14,000. 14,000 uh, was our total load. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think the fortress took about, oh dear, was it about four or five? Well, it depends where they were going. They took five if they were going to uh, Berlin. Yeah, yeah. But we took uh, about 11 to 12 going yeah, to Berlin. Yeah. yeah. But to, the Ruhr was 14,000. 14, yeah. And then the special job for handling those 12,000 pound bombs, That's right. That's right. Uh, they just changed this bomb bay yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. And it just carried one 12,000 pounder. But to lift that load off the deck, oh. this aircraft was a beauty. This, this was made actually to carry about a, a 6,000 pound load. That's right. And the Air Force doubled it yeah. and a little more. <laughs> and when you take off there, she just mush for the first while until yeah. you get some speed behind her. What was your rotation speed? 3,000 for takeoff. And then immediately you lift, we cut back to 2850. Oh, that's RPM. RPM, mm -hmm. And uh, then as soon as you got up to about three or 400 feet, you cut back to 2650. Ease off on the motor signal. And as you take off, first thing, as soon as you get off the deck, you lift your wheels. And the engineer would lift the wheel. And then, as soon as the wheels were in, you start taking your flaps up. Bit at a time. Bit at a time so it wouldn't make the aircraft sink. And uh, by this time, you're up to five, 600 feet. And gaining. But that one time, uh, I always thought you had to have four engines for takeoff, but that one time, Frank, that starboard outer went on takeoff, yeah, 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 and yeah. we had three engines for yeah. takeoff. Yeah. And we, we were hopping over just little hedges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we hit out to the wash uh, to dump our load. Yeah. And you had, we had a a cookie on board, and right. we can't drop that from under 6,000 feet. Or it'll blow up. They blow in contact and blow up the aircraft. Yeah. So we are struggling to get some height be behind it, underneath us. And by the time we got up the wash, and the gas load was lightening a bit, That's right. we got climbing, and we said, well, why can't we go on the target? And we did. And we did. <laughs> we got to 12,000 feet by the target. On and three? On three. What was the fuel capacity? Oh dear lord. Um, Depending on the target. But uh, let's see. 
But just over 20. I was going to say 21 something. Yeah, 21 something. There were two little tanks on the outside that That's didn't right. hold much, and we rarely used them at all. We used the, the two on each side, and they held about 900 apiece. Two together, about 18, 18 1900. One time we were flying low level, Frank, you remember coming back at night over the North Sea and the cloud above us and water 200 feet below us to get underneath a store. And uh, somebody walking there had kicked the cross balance cock, which puts just the fuel flow from the left tank to the, the right. You could burn, run all four engines off of one side or off the other, but with the cross balance cock open, it was flowing from one side to the other. And I said to Frank, I said, it's left wing low. I trim it. And finally, we found out that somebody had kicked this cross balance cock open, and the fuel was running into a left hand tank all the yeah. time. So we were in, that was at 200 feet. Left down, down. And under a cloud. And it was the ocean going like this. And I sweat a little bit that night. How many missions did you fly though? 55 missions. 55 missions. And Frank did 55, but he did three with other pilots after I left. So you two were crewed through the throat? The whole the time, yes. Mm -hmm. Was that rare over there to be? Yes, he, he is quite rare. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as, as um, pathfinders, you, you flew, they had, the requirement was really only to fly one, uh, two. one tour, tour. Mm -hmm. and you flew two tours. That's, that's right. Yeah. But we changed navigators, we changed bomb aimers. My flight engineer and the two gunners and the wireless song they stayed the same. It was rare to keep a gunner that long because that was, it was a high attrition rate for, for tail guns. Well, you know, I keep hearing this story, but at the end of the day, if you weigh things up, any night fighter pilots, uh, they might go for the rear gunner, okay, but the main target was this fella. Mm -hmm. That's why they and put I the... was alongside him up front, <laughs> that's and that's why they, they could that seal thing behind us to protect us. They could do more damage by yeah. knocking this guy out than uh, than the rear gunner. And actually, if your aircraft got damaged, the rear gunner had the best chance to get out. Oh, All he, he did was swing his turret and follow. Drop out. He was there. The pilot had to hold it as well as he could and straight level until the rest got out. So the pilot rarely did get out. If his aircraft was, as soon as he let go of the control, he'd be in a spin yeah. and would, wouldn't get out. How many aircraft did you fly? Different aircraft? You normally flew the same one, I would assume. I got used to the same uh, uh, Lancasters, you mean how many Lancasters did yes. I fly? Oh, I'd hate to number them. Because my aircraft Easy, would be damaged. Jog. Oh, no, no. There's so many. There was Zed, there was... Yeah. The dog was the favorite. Well, that was my airplane yeah. on on Pathfinder Force D dog. When I was on main force, my airplane was E easy. E easy. Yeah. Is that but all the seven squadron? No, no. The e easy main... was six two two squadron. Yeah. But uh, on six two two, I flew well at least six different yeah. Yeah. aircraft. When my aircraft would get damaged, it might be in a hangar for some time getting repaired. You also flew K King, which was uh, originally one of the Dambuster aircraft, was it not? That's right, That's right. it was. And uh, there's a little story behind that. The commanding officer used to only allow experienced crews to fly K King. That was his baby. And uh, when he gave you K King, you know, you made the team. The night I got K King, we had some Americans there to observe our uh, pre-takeoff uh, drill and so on, you know? Bomb load and things like that. And uh, our commanding officer, as I told you, he was an Englishman hiding behind a handlebar mustache. And he had cool, analytical eyes, and he was liking he was enjoying pulling the leg of these American visitors 
So he made a point of it, and he said, uh, for our visitors here, he said, let me say, uh, Quasi, he said, tonight you have the privilege of flying a Cape King. And for our visitors, Cape King was a survivor of the Dam Buster Raid. And he said, it's not quite as good a machine as the other, so he said, we're, we're only giving him a, a, a lighter load. So he said, tonight, cause he said, you're only carrying 13,500 pounds. And he made it sound like that was a half load, and the other aircraft were carrying 14,000 pounds. <laughs> and, uh, their eyes pretty near popped out of their head because they were carrying to the Ruhr about 8,000 pounds. To Berlin, they were carrying 5,000 pounds. And here, this cripple was carrying 13,500. Uh, well, there's, there's still, what, four of us left, but in the eyes of the crew. Maybe five. Maybe five, we yeah, don't know. We don't know one. Mm -hmm. But uh, you and I, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeff, the rig, and Ian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I bet they'd like to be in Elm by Gully. Well, I guess they would. Everybody can't be this lucky. We are yeah. indeed very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay, Frank. Remember over Frankfurt when we, we got the flak damage from behind below here? And yeah. The old bomb member got knocked out. Yes. How much of this was missing? Remember? Mm. All the bomb, all the bomb, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah things blew off and hit them on the side of the head. I think it was about 50% of this gone. Yes. yes. The wind was coming in there, it was about 40 below it was zero. And that and was cold, bro. My knees were pretty near froze. And we didn't hear a thing from the bomb aimer. And we were in flak and searchlights. We'd, I just stuck the nose down and we were going out as fast as we could. And just as I was leaving the target, a little voice spoke up. Hi, hey, Skipper. And usually I say hi, Bonhammer, but in this case, I said hi, George. I'm the note. <laughs> I, I know George, I know him. Just take it easy, when we get out of the target, the boys will get you back in the rest bed. And we found out that he had been hit by bomb panels on both sides of his face, That's right. knocked out, and when we got back to base, we found out he had some concussion. But otherwise, he was okay. Yeah. Shall we go inside and okay. have a look? Right. Go. Remember, Frank. First there, we used to have to run up and test our mags up here. That's right, that's right. Before takeoff. Yep, yep. And the problem with that was that we get our engines up to operating temperature. Yeah, yeah. And if we have a long wait for takeoff, the engines might overheat. That's right. So they stopped that. And the sergeant mechanic, the chiefy, used to make the check an hour or two ahead of time mm -hmm. on the mags. And that eliminated most of our uh, our work. We'd get in and we'd just start her up. That's right. And, and then, then you used to just see we were on number one tanks. Number for, one tanks, select on and uh, start pumping. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we got it up to pressure then, it was back to you. Mm -hmm. And we had the boost levers all right up to the oh, top. So Maximum nice. boost, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. 3,000 RPMs. And then we'd be starting the engines with the uh, cart outside. That's right. And we just cracked this here left outer just throttle little. just a little bit. Yeah. And he'd give me a signal and I'd give him a signal and, yeah. and, and he'd wind her over down there. And when the engine is start, uh, I'd just adjust the throttle a little bit, and then, then he'd come to the port inner. Yeah, mm -hmm. the port out is starting because the alternator was on there. That's right. And then port inner. Uh-huh. 
And then he'd have to move his cart That's right. to the other side. And That's we'd the old trolley act. Mm -hmm. Then we'd... Uh, starboard out. Starboard outer. Starboard inner. The starboard inner. And we were running. And then we just looked to see that they're all running right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the ground crew would... Uh, on my signal, he'd pull the chocks. Chocks away. And we'd taxi slowly out to our point of uh, where we'd have to wait for takeoff. Well, the collection point, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it was all controlled by Aldous Light. We That's weren't allowed right. to use a radio. Oh, no, 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 no. Radio silence. Yep, yep. From then on. Uh-huh. And when he'd give us the, the green light, we'd taxi onto the runway. Yeah. And as soon as we lined up on the runway, we would hold it on brakes until we would get up uh, a fair amount of revs. Yeah. And uh, when you'd felt her start to shake all over, you'd release the brake and you'd start yeah. going down the runway. Yeah. And you had to control your direction with throttles. That's right. We had to lead with the left throttles. Yeah. And all the way across it, left, outer would be the most, and so yeah. on over here. And because the right throttle to, very little. She used to yaw over a bit if you didn't use that oh, sequence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I used to follow you up. And your hand was right behind mine. Right behind mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. Until when, we were airborne. Well, no. At, what? at 65 mile an hour, approximately, the tail would come up. Yep. I could put, push the stick forward and force yep. the tail up. That's it. And then I would get some rudder control. And when we got the rudder control, we could open the throttles a little faster. Yep. And more evenly. Yep. And your hand was right behind mine. That's right. And I'd say full throttle. And you'd and push, push them all the way through, yep. and you'd lock them. That's it. And where's your lock? This side. That's it, right there, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're airborne, it the minute be, you're airborne, uh, we had wheels up, full throttles and, and 3,000 here, and that's pretty hard on an aircraft. Yeah, yeah. You only do that for five minutes. With a full load on, too. That was always a bit of a dicey thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you cut back to 2850. That's right. As soon as we're in the air, and you'd say wheels up, or I'd say wheels up, and you would lift them. Where's your lever? It, that. Okay. And as soon as the wheels were up, what was next? Trim. What did you do with the trim? Uh, now then. So we'd have ten, 10 degrees for takeoff. That's right, yeah. And you'd take it up five at a time. That's it. Mm hmm. That was back here. Mm -hmm. Did you take off with full flap? No, no, ten, no, ten no. degrees of flap, ten. and we take it in in t t five degrees at a time. That's right. And as soon as we had the flap in, we'd cut back to uh, 2650. 2650, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we just start to climb steady. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The worst was over. We're up in the air. Mm -hmm. No problem. Well, the worst for that sequence was over. There was a lot of funny things yet to come. Oh, yes. Yes, there were. But uh, you could start breathing a little easier then. Well, mm -hmm. true enough. Mm -hmm. uh, once you got that 500 feet under, you had a chance. Uh, these aircraft, you know, were only built to carry a, a certain weight. Yeah. The Air Force doubled it. Yeah. So these things used to really stagger into the air. Yeah and uh, they were laboring. And once we got up in the air, and uh, a decent distance, we'd start to look out in there and we'd see our props were going a slightly different speed yeah. and you could hear them throb. Yeah, yeah. So we just make a little synchronize. adjustment. Yeah, synchronize, yeah, synchronize the, the props. And uh, then it was fairly pretty easy going there for a while. Until How many of these things did they build? It was over 7,000, wasn't it? Something like that, something. yeah, something like that. 15 uh, left in existence, of which is only two flying. Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. And then we were, well, on our way, but... Yeah, we're on our way. The only thing we haven't done is get the aircraft trimmed. That's true. Yeah, if, if we get the aircraft trimmed, then I can sit back and relax. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, just like I'm driving along the freeway here. Get but up to operational height and then head to the target area. Yes, uh, but you're climbing a long way. Oh, yes. But, uh, when we were Pathfinders, we didn't go quite so high. Well, no. We'd marked from either 16 or 18,000. That's right. 
And uh, the other aircraft would all be above us. Once in a while they'd we'd get in their way yeah. and they'd drop a, something on us. Uh, but and you, then you, you, you could see the enemy calls coming up, couldn't you, with the German searchlights stuck up there in the sky? Yes, they always tried to take you across the coastline where they said they weren't liable to be, uh, well, yeah. liable to be an open spot, no guns. Yeah, yeah. They often missed, too. <laughs> uh, they forgot those guns would point on an angle. And yeah. they can move them around. Mm -hmm. And then they, when they sent us on the, towards our target, any city in the way, they would have you head for that city and yeah. then last minute pull away, and That's that was right. to keep the whole of Germany awake. That's right. And when you'd get close to the target, they'd start shooting flak up and you'd turn off and go in a little different direction. Mm -hmm. But if that flak wasn't coming up, you know there were some guys up there looking for you. Oh. So it was a question of eyes all round, particularly with the two gunners. Remember how they used to drop those floats, floating flares that would hang there just so they could silhouette you? And, and uh, they'd pick, they'd be below you and they'd, they, the fighters would be above and the flares would be below and they'd silhouette you in there. You could watch for the fighters to come diving down out of, from above. And then at one stage later they started arming the German fighters with these uh, upward firing guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, they'd be below here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the first thing you know about it was when something came walloping past you. Mm -hmm. Well, you remember about roughly, oh, 12 miles from a target, you'd pick up a point. Yeah. And uh, that would be your point where you start a timed run that's right, that's to fine. the target. That's as a pathfinder yeah. where you're going to mark. And you get the first tips from the navigator. Yes. And the from that point 12 miles in, you would have to freeze on your direction yeah. and on your airspeed yeah. and uh, what else? The altitude. Well, of course. Yes, those three things. And uh, you'd be on a time run in. And, and then as, en as engineer with PFF, I used to have to do any visual bombing. That's right, that's Bob right, Manning. that's right. If you saw, if you could see the, the deck below you, I would be down there. Mm -hmm. And also as a pathfinder, we were expected to put our markers down within 100 yards yeah. from 18,000 feet. Yeah. That's, that's close. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you were outside of that, you'd be answering questions yeah. when you got back. I used to like these long distance low levels. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, there were two targets mm -hmm. on the river Giron, wasn't mm -hmm. they? Uh, Colliac oh. and Blay. Oh, oh. And we used to go out low level over the that, south coast and those, stick above the water. Those were fun, they were daylights. Well, true. Mm -hmm. But uh, we took in 100 group. Yeah. Just 30 aircraft yeah, yeah. each time. Yeah. And low level, and they'd follow us. They, di they didn't know how to find the target, but they stay with you. Yeah. And these two targets, they were um, fuel supplies for oh, U-boats and that were operating in the Mediterranean and getting stories, our aircraft. Yeah. They're getting our uh, ships out, out there. I'll never forget those two. I got a direct hit first time, each time. Each time. And as right. soon as you saw the lot come up, the flames and the smoke, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. I was able to tell you, mm -hmm. smack on, but yeah, yeah. And squadron leader Craig was on the first stop. Yeah. Wing commander Baker was on the second. And both times they said, bomb the smoke and flames. Yeah. Yeah. We're dead on. Yeah. And then we flew back low, low level again yeah. over the uh, ocean. Did, wasn't there at one stage uh, one of these huge German transport aircraft way over on the starboard side? Gosh, uh, one I of these transport things. You're right, but I forget what it was about now. Yeah, well, it wasn't. The thing is, I think there were two or three lengths uh, with us who chased it. Yeah. Oh, time, but 50 years. Well, there was a... We do well to remember so much. There was that one aircraft that got two engines knocked out. Yeah. They were on fire, and he was going to head out to sea 
and uh, that's the time that uh, Tubby was marking the target with us. And we went and forced him back in, into uh, France, yeah. so he'd have to land there, so that he would have gone down in the drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those were those were good raids. But you know, eight and a half hours. It was a long time. <laughs> and you know, I wasn't a camel, Frank. I had to call, bring me that old rubber black rubber bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was another one of your jobs. You had to do that for me. I couldn't leave the seat. Thanks for bringing me that old rubber bottle, Frank. Uh, what did you do with it? Where did you empty it? It went into the house. It did? Yeah. Didn't you flush it down and well, say... No, it, that I was self-contained, but another time... Oh, I remember, yes. I thought I remember you saying, piss on you. Yeah. <laughs> you dumped no, it out over another Germany. Another time, if you remember, I was... T we're not taking short, mm -hmm. but I had to get rid and the f next thing we heard, the rear gunner was saying, you dirty bugger. <laughs> it didn't come <laughs> and blown up through the window. I remember that, yes, I remember that. <laughs> hey, um, there was an, an interesting one, and you actually marked this target. And any time, we, we lost our first navigator. Yeah, yeah. And we were trying out a new one. Yep. So we had to go back, instead of being pathfinders, primary, yeah. we had to go back to a support role. Yeah, yeah. And that meant we were just carrying bombs, but we were operating as pathfinders, but uh, without markers. Yeah. And we're actually... Were we supporting Craig or the second man? Deputy. We're, that was Bennett. Yeah, yeah. And on that, we were bombing a target. It was a, it was a refinery hidden underneath a forest. That's right. And you couldn't see a, a thing of the refinery from above. No, 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 no. That was up a little north and a little east of the Ruhr. Yeah. And as we were running our, about a half an hour from the target, Craig came up and he said, my bomb site is unserviceable. Deputy, which was Bennett, take over and mark the target and I will assess. In other words, he would broadcast to the main force, tell them where to bomb. That's it. And as we were running in, you and I were chattering because you were the bomb aimer down in the nose and you were going to drop the bombs. And we decided that the deputy had missed the target. He he hadn't seen it. He'd overshot. He hadn't dropped any markers. Oh, Benny, yeah. And yeah. you said, I said, ask you, can you see the target? And you said, yes. So we decided to drop our bombs. Yeah. And when we dropped our bombs, we were lucky. We got a direct hit. Yeah. What do you mean, lucky? Well, <laughs> well, I'm pulling you like that. No, I mean we could have been wrong. We could have we could have read the target wrong, but we were right. And Alan Craig, he breathed a sigh of relief because all he told uh, the main force coming behind us, bomb the smoking flames, yeah. bomb the smoking flames. And when we got back to to the mess that night, yeah. he he bought a half a keg of beer and. Uh, he toasted me. Yeah, you got that. that. I didn't. I, I, well, I did, mate. That's okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> all the other guys got commissions. I didn't. Well, I was a scruffy one. Hey, that, that's what you wanted. <laughs> and then you remember the uh, well, the, the, the V two or V one rocket sites on the island, on the uh, the Seine. Oh yes, sure. Eel. Mm -hmm. I think that's my pronunciation. Eel de Adam. Something like that. And. Uh, that's when Billy copped it, wasn't it? Made up it. Well, that's yeah. right, that target was heavy. Yeah. We were down at a lower level and they just they just hose that stuff yeah, off yeah, of yeah. us. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a medium oh. flak. And then Billy got it in the arm. Oh, that's the shoulder and the arm. Oh, well. Uh, uh, He's I, a tough old baby, that, wasn't he? He was a tough, but that thing went right through his arm made a mess of things. And then, actually, I was the only St. John's, uh, the only one that had a St. John's certificate. 
So you and Ian, and Ian yeah, that's the wireless up. You got him out of there on the turret, and you got him on the rest bed. Yeah, yeah. And you told me the damage, and I said, just put a flak bandage over it and don't tighten it. Just to keep it clean, but don't tighten it. Because there's shrapnel and stuff in there. That's right. And then we headed for home, and Ian got on his uh, wireless and warned them to have the ambulance ready and the doctor there. Yeah. And we didn't go to circuit at all. We just came straight in on, on the runway. And then we just gave Billy a shot of mouth, you don't we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just a shot to kill the pain. Yeah. And away he went to hospital. And that flak was within a, a millimeter of doing nerve and muscle damage. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it took about um, three months yeah. for them uh, physiotherapy yeah. to get yeah. the action back into yeah. that arm and shoulder. Yeah. 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 What about uh, the flak that came through the window? Mm -hmm. That hit you in the helmet. Well, we had on more than one time we had some flat come in, you know. Oh yes. <laughs> you remember the time that I was banking over the target and came right in through here. Yes. Straight through. It, it hit on the dash here and it just kind of bent one of those little things, and then it ricocheted off of there and it hit my helmet and just put a crease right across there. Yes. Yeah. But not not to damage my helmet, just to mark it. That's all. That was kind of close. Yep. And we said at the time, many times, there was somebody up there looking after us. Oh, there was. Yeah. There was. Don't you believe there wasn't? Uh, wasn't all luck, though. Let's say we oh, were. Oh, no, fair play. Sometimes we were smart. Uh, hey, on the, on the, the, the target, you remember how they'd have um, the primary marker? Uh, we'd have a different sequence every night of colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the primary marker, wh whose marker should be the most accurate, might be red. Yes. And every minute after that, the backers up. They were still pathfinders, but they were a uh, uh, secondary role. That's right. They would remark that red with greens. Yes, yes. And then the master bomber would circle to the side, and he, he'd uh, decide which one was most accurate, yes. and he'd say, bomb the reds oh. or overshoot the reds by one second and uh, that's how you control the up to keep it accurate but when you got on a, on a bombing run you sh weren't supposed to pull off that run no. unless you were going to get shot down and you might remember we marked the target on keel yes and that's yeah. keel's a hot target oh, brother and uh, we were up in front about two or three minutes ahead of everybody else. Submarine pens everywhere, wasn't it? Oh. And going in, about five minutes before the target, they got us with the uh, searchlights. That's right. And we were coned. And the gunners couldn't see anything. With the blue one, too. Oh, yes, the blue, the master. And the wireless op had a little contraption back there, and he could see all aircraft. He could tell fighters from bombers because the fighters would be moving faster. Yeah, yeah. So we told the wireless op, watch for uh, fighters. Yes, because as you said, Billy and uh, they couldn't see. Jeff couldn't see a damn thing. Yeah, and they were panicking a little because they couldn't see. And we were still straight and level, even though their the searchlights were on us and the flak was coming up. But what we were scared of these these fighters and the lethal distance for the fighter coming in is about 800. That's right. And at 800 you have to watch from turning his nose to... Towards you. Yeah, towards us and then that's when he opens up. And Ian was on his uh, machine there, was watching them. We managed to get to the target and drop our, make our drop before these fighters made a move. And two fighters should be able to get you every time. But uh, we were lucky they weren't too smart. But they, when they dived in on us, we went into evasive action. And what was the name of that fellow from Edmonton that was on the mosquito ahead of us? He, he had dropped that window to protect us somewhat. That window, you know, for yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. mucking up the H2S, uh, the radar. Uh, Chris Majerson. Yeah, 
he was flying that Mosquito, and that's the first time he had observed um, a fighter bomber uh, confrontation. And he was banking his aircraft around. Well, he did that fancy, didn't he? No, he didn't do it. No, well, no, no, somebody else did. That's the painting in another one. Uh, Chris was uh, busy banking his aircraft over to watch us in combat, and his navigator, uh, Nobby Clark. Nobby kept telling him what course to go back on. And then Chris would bank over and he'd be looking at us again. And when, when, he, when we got back, he was there waiting for us, because he knew it was us. Yeah. And we, uh, we had a running fight with fighters for about, those two fighters for about 10 minutes. That's right. And then we got into a cloud yeah. and got rid of them. And uh, that was a shaky, that was the worst do I ever had for fighters. Well, we've had a few experiences, Bud, but uh, one of the things I'll never forget, as long as I live, was D-Day. We were confined to camp, weren't we, to begin with? <laughs> they locked us up the day before, didn't they? <laughs> yep. You knew something was up. Well, you knew something, but obviously we didn't know it was it was the thing. Mm -hmm. But then we, uh, as you say, we were locked up and uh, confined to camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, briefed. Uh, what time did we push off? It was late on. No, no, no. We were the first off. We took off in the night. Well, that's what I mean. We, we, it was dark when we left. It was night when we yeah. left, yes. We took off in the dark. And uh, it broke daylight afterwards as we were heading home. Yeah. But uh, it was half light while we were on target area. But when we took off, the only others up in the air were Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, the sky was massive. I just, oh, dear I God. I never saw so many airplanes in my life. Like great swarms of bees. Mm -hmm. and, and then we went, uh, we got over, well, our target was Wisterham, wasn't it? The yes, big gun emplacement. That's it, that's it. But, you know, uh, when before we took off, they didn't know how to uh, brief us, what to expect. And we were expecting the worst, and actually, we had an easy time. Yeah. It was one of the easiest trips we ever made. That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, it, very exciting. See the... Those, all those craft underneath oh, us. Oh, uh, Lord, that's the thing I'll never forget. How many ships were there? God knows. The water was covered. And the poor beggars, the, well, we were safe up beyond them. But a lot of the things that uh, they went through, oh, I don't know. That, a lifetime of horror in one day. Yeah. And that was a nice gesture I, I wrote to you about the French government, uh, creating this medal uh -huh. for anyone involved uh, in D-Day, and particularly those, uh, they call it the Bayer medal, didn't they? That's right. But you know, Bomber Harris tried to get one for all air crew that operate in yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Vice Marshal Bennett yeah. tried to get one uh, recognizing Pathfinders. Neither of them were successful. The politics down in London Prevented it. All the other campaigns uh, were, were, were special, like Africa Star and Burma Star, but as you say, they. Uh... Well, the Pathfinders made this much difference, Frank. Before they were formed, there was less than 5% of the bombs hitting the target. Yeah. And within six months from their formation, there was over 80% yeah. on target. Yeah. And we increased from there, and that's a that's a change, and I think it was worth some extra yeah. reward. Well, uh, at least you and I, and several more, have got our Pathfinder wings. Oh, that's right. And they reckon that they, because there were so few of us left, mm -hmm. if you wanted to sell, oh. which neither of us do, no. you could get a lot of money for that. Oh yes, eagle. Mm -hmm. Well, that crazy darn wireless off ours. He sold his DFM there because yeah. his wife wanted to buy a carpet. And well, I, I put that right for him. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's crazy. I wouldn't sell mine. I know, but poor old Ian must have been in a bad old way. Uh, I think he must have been bossed by his wife. She wanted a new carpet. So he, he got about 
Oh, I don't know. Was it 15 quid? 15 quid. quid. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. But when I found out about that, uh, he knew nothing about it. No, no. Uh, I just asked mm -hmm. Beryl, his wife, for mm -hmm. uh, a son mm -hmm. <coughs> who's the chief super in the kit. In the, mm -hmm. And I got him. You know, Frank, please. getting away from D Day, all times, we had some laughs, too, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you remember when we were on Sterling? And we were doing trying to fly at night and get in some night circuits and boats. Oh, aye, 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 aye. And they sent us to a, an operational drone <coughs> to do our practice so we could we'd be the only aircraft there and go up and down in a hurry. Was, was that Sterling Shell or was it another one? No, it was the neighboring station. Oh, aye. And, uh, we, oh, aye, old Billy. Go well, on, yeah, carry on. I'll tell you, three nights in a row, we went over this neighboring station to... to do some practice circus and bumps, and we'd do one landing, and then we'd get a recall because um, fog was rolling in. Right there, yeah. And the next night, this instructor—he was a Canadian in the yeah, RAF. Yeah, yeah. He said, "You give me one good landing," and he says, "You're gone." And I gave him one that passed, and. We went off, and as soon as we got in the air, and we had to fly around for half an hour to charge up our accumulators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what they call them in England. We that's call right. them batteries over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Sterling was an electrical aircraft, and you had to, all these batteries had to be charged up. And we fly around for half an hour, and while I was flying around, the uh, gunners were happy to get rid of the extra guy and the, uh, the instructor out of there, and they were chattering, nattering. I let them go for quite a while, and then when it's time to Calls for, uh, permission, to permission to land, Kate. Well, I, I have permission to land. I uh, said, okay, shut up, off the intercom. And I pressed the button and I said, let's see, how was it? Well, Hello, Pioneer, this is Villa V. Victor. May I pancake? Over. And this year, very nice voice came back. Oh, she should have been on the BBC. She was good. And she came back and she had nothing else to do, so she was putting on a good act with us. And she said, came back and she said, uh, Villa V. Victor, you have a pancake. Over. Now, to finish a conversation, you have to use out. But yeah. Billy. Your finger was still on the button. I still had my finger on the button, and <laughs> Billy said, Gee, I sure looked the pancake her. <laughs> and I got my finger off the button, but she's not fast enough. And she came back and she said, Thank you, Villa V. Victor, over and out. And all night, we, for five hours, we carried on, and she carried on this act so well, and uh, she was so sweet and nice. Two days later, you know, Ian was on a bus going down to Cambridge, and he heard two girls ahead of him. The bus was crowded, two girls ahead of him, and they were talking about, the one girl was telling the other about her experience and how this happened. And, uh, Ian realized that it was not true, because yeah. she mentioned my name. She, that's the only thing she knew, so Flight Sergeant Cosby and crew. So uh, she had in her mind that it was the pilot that had made this remark. She was so upset or excited or whatever you like to call it, because uh, she had expected some kind of remark like that, but she didn't realize that it was a uh, it was a uh, uh, no. But she didn't realize the Yorkshire accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the instructor told her it oh. was a Canadian. The pilot was a Canadian. Uh, but anyway, correct. two years later, you know, did you know that just before I finished uh, ops at Oakingham, I think it was my third last. I had three trips to go, and uh, I was in a bar with a chief medical officer in the station and the navigation leader and the, and the bombing leader. And we had a drink and somebody called me by my name. And a few minutes later, a Canadian flight lieutenant came across and he said, is your name Cosy? And I said, yes. And I stood up and we shook hands. And there's so many fellows you meet, but you don't see them a long time. And I said, gosh, I can't, I don't recall meeting you before. He said, you haven't. And he kind of smiled. He says, the young lady with me over there says she knows you. <laughs> and he's, she wants uh, you to come across and have a drink with us. So I said, I'll, I'll come across shortly. I, I had to go, the ground crew in the back room, and I had to go and buy them a drink. And when I came back, I, I wandered across, and 
I saw this lady, she had a, or not a lady, a young lady, put her that way, she was good looking. And uh, she had kind of a half smile on her face. And I tried to open up the conversation with her and I said, gee, I don't remember you. And uh, she said, where did you do your, where did you do, train on Sterling? And I told her, and I said, I didn't know you at that station. I said, that was a horrible station. Wartime drone. And she said, I didn't say I was on that station. And uh, she was, she says, where did you do your night training? And I caught her voice just then. Uh -huh. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> after two years. Oh, Billy, is it a light to pancake? Uh... Yeah, I yeah. hear <laughs> That's the way it happened. How old were you guys when you were flying these things? Well, I was just 18. And you were 20, what, 26? 26, 27. Mm -hmm. 27. A long time ago. I was... How old were you when I finished? I finished... I was uh, 28 anyway. Well, yeah, it's two years. Two yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I was... Two years. I just got out. Not got out. I was... Uh, uh, at the aerodrome. Well, I wasn't aerodrome. At the station where I met Margaret, my wife. How much time did you have flying before you came on my crew? Very little. How much? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, just a minute, just a minute. Just one flight, wasn't it? About, uh, well, there's on Lank 2s. Mm-hmm. Lank mm -hmm. 2s. Uh, an hour, not much more. Mm -hmm. Not much more. Well, you know, that's kind of, kind of a rough goal. Oh, yeah. That's a fast yeah. conversion. Well, like I said, bud, we're together. We're here. Yeah. But there's so many, many of our colleagues. They come. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you remember Friedrichshafen? Oh, ah. Uh, <laughs> across, the, across the lake. Across Lake Constance? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know how we got into that one? Uh, uh, well, well, on. it was number one priority target because mm. there, there was a station there of uh, German um, scientists. Yeah. They had 15,000 estimated. Uh, German scientists stationed there developing new uh, instruments of horror and they were very close to perfecting one much more horrible than the, uh, anything they had in the, in the line of uh, buzz bombs and stuff like that that they could wipe out England. So this was number one target and uh, being in summer days and, and short nights uh, the moon was up. Oh, uh, yes. I remember. The Americans volunteered to take the target. There was no opposition. They went in the first day. They had no opposition at all, but there was a thin layer of cloud. And the Germans got wise to that. They went and flew, a, uh, they bombed an optional target. They went to go back the next day and they just blew the crap out of them. The Germans never even got there. The Americans didn't even get to the target. So the very same night, the uh, British command said, we've got to do it and do it ourselves now. And they picked two crews from every flight in Bomber Command so that they wouldn't hit any one flight too hard. We were lucky enough to get chosen for that, or unlucky enough. <laughs> when they briefed us, they didn't, they didn't brief the, the only ones that had in the briefing were the pilot, the navigators, no. and the bomb aimers. And we, Later on, when we were in the air, we told you where we were going. And it was daylight, we are flying over France, bright as can be. And it turned dark before we got to Germany. And uh, rear gunner came up and he said, uh, Skip. He says, Combats all over place. And New Yorkshire men, they drop a lot of words. And the mid upper, the mid uppers wanted to quieten him down a little bit because he's older, and he said, "Those aren't combats. There's too many. They're scarecrows." And I wanted to end the conversation. And I said, "No, those are combats. Get off the intercom. 
and stay off. If you have something to say, say it. And I'll put on a weave now so that you, you'll have, uh, you can see further. And we weaved all the way to the target. And, you know, we knocked that target off that Yeah. Day. That was some sight across the lake. Ooh, brother. The, the uh, Swiss were sitting on the lake watching the That's whole right. show. It was a show. <laughs> that, view. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we lost a lot of aircraft there. We lost a lot of aircraft. Yeah. That was a bad one. It's, that's three group, and we were on 622 Squadron at Milden Hall. And then we moved to Pathfinder Force, which is in eight group. Mm -hmm. And that is eight group, and seven squadron is right there. And seven squadron was a, a prime squadron in the First World War as well. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters, members, donors, and subscribers. It's a pleasure producing these fascinating little vignettes for you. If you really enjoyed it, hit the thanks button, as this will contribute to the 4K film scanner that arrives this December. With your generous support, the 4K upgrade project will be a reality this January. Have a great day, be kind, and we'll see you again next time on Real Life.